Well, uh, I want to bring a message. Uh, I was telling the staff this week as we talked about this weekend's service, I said, I'm not so sure that this weekend may not be the more important one because I feel like most of our people will come next week with their card filled out, and uh, that would be the hopes anyway. But I wanted to um, bring a message that has been on my heart and mind. I've preached variations of this oftentimes in missions meetings. I've, I've I've spoke this message even uh, in other countries uh, at, at retreats and so forth. I, I, just, I just love it. It always speaks to my heart. Usually I'm challenged by it in my own life when I'm making decisions, as you just heard my commitments uh, just a little bit ago. But uh, going all in. What does it look like to go all in? Matthew 13 and verse 44 Again, the kingdom of heaven is like, and it, by the way, again right there means there's a continuation of thought. I'll describe that in a moment. But the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid and for joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, in just simple terms, here's what's happened. Perhaps, uh, and by the way, don't we always see uh, the word of God in stories from our own filter? Uh, I grew up in the country, and oftentimes it's like I'm going to go to my friend's farm, but I, as, as opposed to just walking down the road or riding a bicycle down the road, I think if I cut through this field, you know, I'm going to go to the Roberts farm, if I, so I could cut through the Garrison's farm and the Smith farm, and I could end up there quicker. So maybe I'm doing that. So here's a person maybe just cuts through a field, and it, it, not so much that he found a treasure there, but the treasure found him. He's just stumbling through. The Bible didn't say what it is, but he found something. Maybe it's partially buried. Maybe it's something that's kind of covered up. But he realizes there's this incredible treasure. And you know, when you found something that's worth something, and perhaps it's been there forever, you know, it's just one of those things of who knows how it got there, why it's there. But he realized, I, I could buy this whole field and come up with that treasure, and I could have it. But it's going to cost me everything I have. But it wasn't much of a struggle for joy. He went and sold all that he had and went and bought that field that he might have that, might have that treasure. So Jesus oftentimes spoke to his listeners in parables. If you're in a life group, uh, we give some other things to uh, talk about. When you get together this week, you're going to read a big swath of Scripture right here about those parables. But So you have that to look forward to. But parables are just simply short stories. Uh, that it's perfect. Jesus of fulfilling prophecy. Isaiah said he would come speaking parables. He's speaking these short stories. It's common man language. It's word pictures that people of that day could understand and they could relate to. I grew up again in the country, and country people are famous for little short stories or little short statements that illustrate something. I grew up my whole life hearing things like this. Uh, they're always comparable stories. So I'm as sure as this, as that. As sure as a martin bird is heading for his gourd, I'm going where I'm going. As sure as there is a cow in Texas, something is as crooked as a dog's hind leg, or that's as twisted as a pig's tail. Lots of things had to do with hogs and pigs. I don't know why from the South. But anyway, those are word pictures. When you see that, you get an idea of what's being said, but the incredible thing about these parables is there's no bottom to them. All the depth you want to go in these simple stories, it's just incredible. God spoke these words, and they have such depth, and they can work such incredible things in our own hearts and lives if you allow the Lord to do that. So this parable is just one verse. It's a transition uh, in your Bible from what Jesus has been talking about a little bit earlier in the chapter he has been teaching his disciples in many verses how there go there's going to be righteous seed, the word of God, sown into the world. Remember how that chapter started, the sower went out to sow. It's talking about the word of God. It's also talking about the work of God. And then he tells them there's going to be an enemy that comes against the word of God and against the work of God to hinder the word of God and the work of God. And we understand that by the condition of the soil. There's the presence of rocks and thorns and birds are going to come devour it. And Satan is going to sow counterfeit seed. Remember the parable of the, the wheat and the tares? There's counterfeit seed that's going to be sown into the Word and into the work of God even. Everything that God is doing, Satan's trying to copy and try to lead people astray with that. 
And then he talks about how there's going to be attacks inside the church and from outside the church. Those are the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven. And so he's describing this struggle, this struggle that's going to go from the next couple of thousand years. So after an explanation of the sower, Jesus speaks three parables right in a row. It's a trilogy of sorts. And they are the first one that I gave you, the treasure in the field. Then he talks about the pearl of great price, just a couple of verses. And then the dragnet. And the treasure in the field mainly is about Israel. I'll describe that in a moment. The pearl of great price is about the church. And the dragnet is the final judgment. Probably speaking of after the millennial reign of Christ, there's a final judgment of the separating of what's good and what's bad. So I want to do a few things in the message tonight. One, I'm going to give a quick theological aspect or perspective of the parable because a Bible preacher should always do that. And then I want to give you some practical principles because you ought to have something you can go home with. And then I'm going to point out that you ought to have a plan for reevaluation in your life about how to go all in. So theological perspective. We know from the previous parables in Matthew 13, the field in which the parable is speaking about is the world. Just plain and simple. The parable, the, the, talking about the field is the world. The world was intended by God to be a display of his kingdom. Our prayer is thy kingdom come, thy will be done on heaven as it is on earth, right? So the idea is we should be reflective of that. But because of sin, this world does not look much like what his kingdom should look like. Satan has done a pretty good job of destroying a lot of the image of God uh, in this world and certainly in people's lives. Probably the two most famous verses in all the Bible would be Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? I don't know which one would be more popular, John 3-16. Uh, most people even know the reference because they hold it up at football games and things like that. We've had generations doing that. But it's simply, let me just give just the part of it, for God so loved the world. Now, world right there is not cosmos, but it's the people of the world, right? Genesis 1-2, if you backed up uh, to right out of the book, would later go on to tell us the world was without form and void, and it was covered with darkness, that's a picture of what God's creation would look like without him. The whole gospel is given in the first couple of verses of the Bible. Here's the world created, but it's in darkness without form and without void. That's what all of our lives are without Christ, without him in our lives. We're without form and we're void and we're in darkness. But the next verse says, let there be light. And that is a picture of what God does. He comes in and we walk in the light. We get redeemed when we see the light. And make no mistake, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. John 3, 16 again, he speaks of his love for the world and the people who would live in darkness of sin. He tells of his willingness to give his only son to redeem the world. For God so loved the world that he gave. So we are the object of his love, and the motivation for God sending Jesus was that he loved us. Yeah. We were walking in darkness, but we've seen a great light. Amen. He's come to us, amen? Yeah. John 3, 17, it's often not quoted with it, but it's so beautifully, and so, uh, so beautifully pointed and put there, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's what people think sometimes. Well, he, we're just here, he's just here to condemn us. You were condemned already. You were in darkness and walking in a void without God, but he came to you in that condition that the world through him might be saved. Amen. He loved us and did that for us. So God has not abandoned us. Watch now. And he's certainly not abandoned his, his covenant people, Israel. Israel is the treasure, theologically speaking, in this, in this uh, message. So... Uh, he, Jesus sees Israel as the great treasure hid in the field of darkness. Amen. The parable applies to his church, but just in principle, it's not the main subject. We, his church, are the next one. Yes. The pearl of great price. Amen. I don't even have to preach this. You can just think about it two seconds and would have it. How is a pearl made? The oyster gives its life to make the pearl. 
Well, you see where that's going, right? So that's, that's the church. The history of the church is given in that, in that, one, that one parable. But uh, the history of all of Israel is really given in this one verse. That's why I said it doesn't have a bottom to it. You could think about it the rest of your life, applying what you know from Scripture and never get to the end of what he's saying right here. The whole message of the Old Testament is simply this, God telling Israel, a people he's called unto himself, I will be your God, you'll be my people. Amen. I'll be your God, you'll be my people. But the, the, So the imagery of that is carried throughout the entire Bible. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jewish people, God's treasure, are scattered over the Bible lands. You remember God says, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, but here's what's required of you. They'd walk with God for a while, then they would get away from God for a while, and then his promise was judgment. Yes. And oftentimes in that judgment, he would scatter them among the nations, and there would be a regathering. We're going we're gonna to go into a great series of messages leading up to Easter and right past Easter called Headlines. Things about prophecy. You want to know what the Bible is really talking about? Make sure your focus is always Israel. You want to know how late it is? Look what's going on in Israel. You want to see what God's doing? Focus right there. It doesn't mean that we're not important or that they're more important, but I'm telling you how God is telling time is what's going on with his covenant people. So listen how unique this parable is in light of these things. Jesus saying the treasure has been here all the time. When Jesus spoke those words, Rome was in power. Roman soldiers marched up and down the promised land and had no idea of the promises of God to these people. God's son, Jesus, speaks these words in a time when the Romans, again, were in charge. The Jews were hidden in a world run by the Romans. And they were scattered throughout the Bible lands. In fact, they, they honestly... Jewish people from that, for really from that day and shortly after that day, have been like ordering hash browns at the Waffle House. They're scattered, covered, and smothered throughout the lands, right? That's where they're at. But in these last days, there's a regathering. Folks, you think that, who do you think most of the people living in Ukraine, I don't say most, but a, a, a lots of people, they're Jewish Ukrainian people. The, just, there's always some connection to all that. Not today's message. Israel is the treasure. The man in the parable represents Jesus himself. He uncovers the treasure in the field. He announces who he is. Even though they're hid among the nations, Jesus has come to them, come to the very city where all the promises are made there in Jerusalem, announces who he is and what he has come to do. But like in the parable, no sooner has he found the treasure that was hid that it's covered up once again. Jesus, the rightful king, what, is, what does the scripture say about him? He came into his own and his own received him not. He's announced who he was, but they said, we will not have this man to rule and reign over us. Crucify him. So no more than he's made the announcement uncovered them, they're covered again and some other time I'll describe in the coming messages they're scattered among the nations and it wasn't many years after this they really were scattered among the nations but he was not discouraged in this for joy, for joy he's bought this field so there's a theological perspective that's there now I doubt we have probably one Jewish person here but we're a Gentile church so what's some practical principles that we readily see from this? Notice again, the man was not discouraged in the parable when he hid the treasure by covering it up once again. In fact, he had the opposite reaction, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. For joy, though we are not Israel, we principally here apply. There's only one time in the gospel record we read that Jesus had rejoiced over something, and it is when he sent the 70 out and gave them power to walk in the kingdom, power over demons and death and all kinds of stuff. He sent them out 
really it was on a soul winning mission and when the 70 return they're like Jesus you can't believe this I mean we even had authority over the demons I mean death had no hold on us all these incredible things happened and what they're saying is we had some sample treasures we brought back with us and then Jesus says in Luke chapter 10 verse 21 this is his response in that hour Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said I thank you father uh, Lord of heaven and earth, you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent. I tell you who didn't believe that, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, that's the political parties of that day, all the leaders, none of them believed any of it, but all the common people, all those sorts of people, to them it's revealed to them, to the babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. So that's just what's beautiful right there. So Jesus is offering us out of this. Because we can, we can become part of that Gentile church. So we're, hey, I believe the story, amen? amen? I believe Jesus was the Messiah, died for us. Amen. amen. Come on now. So he's saying, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom if you'll follow me, and uh, you can do business for the keys of the kingdom, but you are going to have to make some adjustments in your life to make sure that you can do business for the king. Amen. It requires something of me and of you to do his business. As people, we have three major areas in our lives that we struggle with. It's universal. Wouldn't matter where you are, what culture you lived in, here are the three things you will struggle with. Your pleasures, your positions, and your possessions. Universal. I like what I like. I like doing what I like to do, right? Amen. I got a button and a thing on my desk and this is my position I've worked my way up I'm I'm somebody whatever that looks like in your life and then this is my stuff yeah. it's my things I've run out of storage I got to rent places <laughs> amen? Yeah, amen we all know whoever dies with the most wins right <laughs> we're hoarders at some level we tend to measure these things and treasure these things. And the evidence of that sometimes is when someone passes away. Oh my goodness. What are we going to talk about? What he enjoyed. Yeah. What position he held and the stuff he had. Yeah, amen. That's what we talk about. As if we're getting a U-Haul and pulling the casket to heaven. Right? But we talk about, well, this is what they enjoyed, this is who they were, this is what they had. I, I, I have a, a friend that pastored across town from me where I was at in Atlanta, and uh, Mel Blackaby had the privilege of pastoring Truett Cathy. Uh, perhaps you've heard of him. You've probably supported him. Uh, he owned Chick-fil-A. And in those years, my church secretary lived down the road uh, from, from Truett Cathy. Uh, he still lived in the 1950s house with a carport, a billionaire with a B. Now, he had a barn out back with millions of dollars worth of cars in it, so I, I don't want to say it's all just, you know, poor. But he taught Sunday school at First Baptist Church Jonesboro for 50 years. They had several-hour funeral service, and I remember Mel Blackaby because his kids went to my school, we were talking about it one day. He said, you know, after hours of a funeral service, do you know the only thing not mentioned in that service? Chick-fil-A. I would have led with that. Amen? <laughs> Love me some sweet tea and an eight count, right? <laughs> not one mention. It was all about what he gave, his influence, what he did for the kingdom. I don't know if it was by design or not, but not one solitary mention of Chick-fil-A. If you're looking for real joy in this world, it not, it's not going to be held long in how this world measures success, which is how the world measures it in your pleasures and your positions and your possessions. Ironically, the hardest area for people to make changes in is in what I, my, my pleasure is and my positions are and my possessions. Don't mess with that stuff because now you're messing with people's little G God. 
Don't mess with it. Now, I like doing what I do. I like my stuff. Don't. Ironically, the hardest areas for us to change are in those three things. Therefore, we must have a plan for reevaluation. We need to see things for how they truly are, not how just we perceive them to be. Now, let's do no harm to Jesus' parable since I've already told you what right theology is. The subject here is Israel. But let's put ourselves, does it no harm, I promise you. Let's put ourselves in the parable as the man who found the treasure hid in a field and see what we might would do. Let's think about what we might would do. We will reevaluate or make changes in our lives when we, when we discover something greater by which to measure our life with. I will make changes in my life when I find something greater than my possessions and my position, right? When I find something greater to measure by, I'm willing to change and I need to reevaluate. I'm going to simply call this selling out to buy in. Selling out to buy in. That's what athletes do. Am I right? How do you become a champion? You sell out. I'm going to work harder, do more, stay longer, come early, eat right, lift more, run faster, work harder. I know there's God given talent to some level of that, but it's also what's your potential. And at some point, if you're going to be a real champion, it's going to cost you something. If you've ever played on a championship team, somewhere along the way of a championship season, you probably wanted to quit because it costs you a whole lot more than you thought it was going to, to be a part of that. Investors understand this. Listen, I, we come over here and we put money aside and we're waiting for the right deal. And when the right deal comes along, then we can sell out to buy in and amass what we want to do with it. We understand we're looking for the right opportunity. When we find that treasure, we buy it. Hey, here's the stock. Yeah, I mean, this is the one. I don't mean gambling. I, there's always an area of risk in this, but I'm talking about prudent saving, putting it together, but at some point, if you're going to have something, you're going to risk something. So athletes understand it. Investors understand it. Uh, athletes don't become champions by, by, you know, just monkeying around. They, they got to they gotta get all in. So truthfully, this is where the Christian life is supposed to begin. This is rarely ever preached. Y'all are so lucky. I'm telling you, I've won a lifetime without hearing anybody talk about this. And it's just missed. It's basic Christianity. The Christian life is supposed to begin all in. We understand that when Jesus, <laughs> he went all in. He went all in. He gave up everything for us. Heaven, think about what he gave up. He gave up all that. He left heaven because he so loved us. He wanted to make a way for us. He gave his life for ours. He sold out to buy us in. Amen. The apostle Paul wrote that we were bought with a price. And what was the price? His own blood, Jesus' own blood. Amen. He sold out to buy us in. Jesus, who was rich, Paul would say, became poor that the... Through his poverty, you and I could become rich. And it doesn't mean material wealth. It's talking about rich. A rich man knows him. Yes, amen. He sold out, bought me in. And the beginning place for a Christian is, I see he left everything to buy me in. He paid it all. Watch now, all to him I owe. Amen. The beginning spot. But somehow along the way, we've made things like, Pastor, do I tithe before taxes or after taxes? Can I answer that question for you by just asking another question? Are you trying to ask, how little can I do and be respectable? 
Why are we, why are we saved years and years and still talking about what fraction of my income and life should I give him? The beginning spot should be all in. Athletes don't become champions <laughs> by just messing around. Investors don't amass wealth by just what little bit I can do here and there. Why do we think Christianity should be practiced with an idea of giving Jesus fractions of our life here and there? Some spare change and some spare time and just doing our little thing. He wants you to see him for who he is and what he has done for you. That's what he wants. And he wants you to be all in for his mission. Amen. All in. He wants you. Well, pastor, he does he want my tithe? He doesn't care two bits about your tithe. He wants you. Forget about the, the amounts and the time and the stuff and trying to mathematical formula what you're doing with your Christian life. He wants you, Amen. all of you, every fiber of your being to be all in. And when he has you, it's no problem then to work out the other stuff. Amen. The struggle is when he don't have all of us and we're not sure we're all in and we... Yeah, I don't know what to do here and all that. It's not meant to be that hard. The question shouldn't be, Lord, what do you want me to give? It should be, Lord, what do you want me to keep back? <laughs> but we get all upside down and all messed up and confused over these little pesky little issues of our pleasures and our possessions and our positions. Does anybody in this room know the name R.G. Letourneau? Anybody? R.G. Letourneau. It's amazing. R.G. Letourneau in 1902 would have been 14 years old. God gifted that young boy with an incredible mind, mathematical, or I should say mechanical mind, uh, inventor's mind. That really is a gift of God. Y'all know that, right? Yes, He's moving uh, sand and dirt all day long from one pile, make another pile. And after one day of that, he invents something to make that job easier. And some of you right now like know what that is. He's just that kind of kid. He would put that together. God gifted him. He started uh, mechanical work, became a welder, inventor. If you think about Depression era, this is what road construction looked like. We'd go down to prison, get 100 men in shovels, and we'd go dig out a road. And we'd dig the ditches out, and then we'd bring gravel and buckets. That's, that's, that was how roads were built, Depression era. Well, this R.G. Letourneau, begin to be a person that reshaped all that because he, he's the guy who invented earth-moving equipment. That's who did it. 70% of all the equipment used in World War II, R.G. Letourneau manufactured. What's really unique about him is he was one of the most committed Christian people to ever draw a breath. He believed in his day the only way you could be totally sold out for Jesus Christ was to be a missionary. And so here this young businessman went to his pastor and said, I, I feel like I've got to give God my whole life to be really, let's use it in words we're going to get all, I want to sell out to buy in. And his pastor with great wisdom said, uh, R.G., God needs Christian business people too. And he's gifted you with ways to do certain things, and he encouraged him to stay with that and help finance the work of God. R.G. Letourneau did this. He says, God is my partner. He is the controlling partner of all that I do. And out of his company, not only did he tithe, he gave tons of money away. In the Depression era, 
You, you know what it was, uh, everything failed in the Depression era. He struggled in the Depression era. They would send accountants down to his company and they'd go, what's this $5,000 check? Now listen, Depression era, that'd be like, what's this $200,000 check? Oh, that's to my church. Oh, we can't do that. And he would argue around about him. He said, this is my first debt. <laughs> you track his his revenue through depression era it was millions of dollars shortly thereafter through the depression era he amassed so much money I, I, listen he had such great quotes do you have we have quotes up here right quick I, I, two things I like most to do one is to design machines turn the power on to see them work the other is to turn on the power of the gospel and see it work in the lives of people wow, absolutely love that you, you know, uh, yeah, look, that's his equipment, by the way. That kind of stuff did not exist before God gave this man wisdom about how to do all that. He had other, a couple more great quotes right there. I just want to give them. Never let unfair stop you. <laughs> I said that for some young people. It's just so unfair. Yeah. Failure is opportunity to in work clothes. Love, love, love this man. Laterno University, Longview, Texas, founded by him. Generational wealth comes from, from him. At the gentle urge of his wife, R.G. Laterno gave 90% of his income away and lived on 10. He said, I shovel money out and God shovels it back, but he has a bigger shovel. God's word often challenges us, our position, our possessions, our pleasures. Here's a man that says, God's gifted me this way for this purpose. I'm telling you, the kingdom of God, though none of you knew who he was, I promise you, you've been impacted by not only his inventions and the winning of World War II, and probably some way through the kingdom of things he financed. I hope you see a great treasure when you look at what your money could do in the work of God, and I hope it feels cheap to keep it. By the way, the treasure really is finding God's will and doing it. <laughs> it's just that. The greatest thing I ever did in my life was sell out to buy in. The greatest thing. And it will always cost you something on the front end. But I got to a place, it was no longer about my tithe or a percentage or whatever. Hey, God, what? it's yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm from Arkansas originally. Some of you might be familiar with a guy named Sam Walton. The fifth store was in my hometown, the fifth Walmart. People that worked for him in those early days, I remember them when I was a teenager. The stock ladies at our store, all of them by the time I was in my 20s were millionaires because he didn't have money to pay them. So he gave them stock. A man named John Hawks lived in our town, smart businessman, worked in, with Sam Walton, in those early days, I was in John Hawks' home, which was palatial. And he's telling us, a handful of us there one night, he said, uh, I'd come home and, I didn't, and, and I'd tell my wife, well, I didn't get paid again this week. But he, Sam gave us stock. And he said, my wife got so mad one night, she took that stock and threw it up against the wall and said, we can't eat this. He said kind of with a sly smile and she got over that. <laughs> right? In this palatial house, that stock went from here to worth nothing to... And you know what all of us set back and we would like to do? Well, I wish I had that opportunity. I wish I could find something like that. Many of you are walking over a great treasure every week of your life 
and God's showing you all around you, this is what I would like to do. Would you like to buy in? Well, you know, I got a thing. I got ball. I got whatever. I got stuff. I'm going to go do this, go do that. Y'all don't want me to get wound up on any of that. We need a reevaluation. I'm just watching the clock, see how much I want to do to you. <laughs> I was a young man. I heard a man named Leon Kilbreth speak in a Sunday school campaign. <laughs> the Southern Baptists called him Mr. Sunday School, Leon Kilbreth. And I'm telling you, the things that he said when I heard him in my 20s, it's, I mean, it just, I'd never heard anybody say stuff like he did. And then when he, uh, when I was pastoring in Atlanta, I tracked him down. He was, at the time that I got him to come to my church was 94 and could still preach like a house on fire. And Leon, here's what I remember about Leon Kilbreth. He was so careful to say it. He said, when God saved me and then he called me to really help the church and to be a part, and I realized that I could come help really set up the, you know, be like someone saying, I've set up the life groups. How about that? It's our context. He said, I learned how to lead people to Christ. I learned how to disciple them. And he said, I'm telling you, it wasn't long. I, I, I sold my fishing boat. I sold my shotguns. I quit golfing. He said, and I knew my wife almost had a heart attack. I sold my beagle hounds because she knew I loved a rabbit hunt more than anything. And he said, there wasn't anything wrong with any of that. And he said, in fact, I'd still enjoy it. But hear what I'm about to say. He said, I just found something that brought so much more joy than any of that together. And I just no longer really had interest in that. And I'm going to tell you, that'll shape you up. Not a pastor, not just, just a man sold out doing the work of God. I found something I enjoyed so much more than just doing the other. Again, when you compare how seeing people come to know Christ through what we do here. Let me tell you why some of us really rejoice when people are saved in this building. Oh, yeah. Can I say it this way? Because we bought the field. Yeah, amen. <laughs> when you buy the field and you see the treasure come forth week after week, <laughs> wow. yeah. in fact, it just feels so foolish to want to hold something back. When I see the tra that which I treasure is what God treasures. Yeah. I do need to mention this. You need to buy the whole field. Well, I just want the treasure part. Well, guess what, bub? You got to buy the whole thing. You don't get to go over and survey a two foot by two foot and pull it out. Amen. You buy the whole field. Pastor, there's a lot about church I don't like. Me too. <laughs> Me too. I wish we'd do this or do that. Sometimes I do too. You know what? It ain't about me and it ain't about you. Amen. That's right. If we only did things I liked around here, most of you probably wouldn't like it. <laughs> Vice versa, right? Amen. Since when did we think the work of God is a buffet? That's right. Well, I just want this and that. I want these things without those things. I just want to come in and get what I get. You, you can't do that. Amen. You got to buy the whole field. I can give you 10 illustrations. I just don't have time. But it's just not a buffet. I'll tell you how you can know. We'll quit right here. I know, I know, and you can know when you've bought in. If you're wondering when it is. Because some of you think, oh, it's just uh, it's when I give this or that. Do you think you could write a check big enough to impress God? How dumb is that? But you need to know when you've bought in. 
the man went and got all that he had together and he considered it nothing <laughs> that he might that he might own that treasure and for joy he went and did it now I want you to think about you leaving here tonight putting a for sale sign at your house putting all your possessions in the front yard and having a yard sale listing your cars for sale putting your I mean it's going to take everything to buy in I mean that's, that's the mindset here and then you get real happy thinking about but when I do I'm coming away with the treasure that's worth more than all of it it's exactly what Paul told the Philippian church in chapter 3 verse 7 and 8 because Paul had possessions Paul had a position he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee right and he had great pleasure in his inner working with the people he was around. But when Christ Jesus confronted him and saved him, but what things were gained to me, these things I counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. Some translations say dunghill. Everything that I possessed is a manure pile compared to the treasure I found in Christ. And he wrote that while sitting in jail. If what you're doing in the work of God does not produce uncontrollable joy in your heart, look at me in the face while I tell you, you're living on somebody else's commitments. You're living on somebody else's commitments and they're not your own. If you're not bringing you joy, you're a renter and not an owner. You've been coerced. <laughs> Don't be coerced. You've not discovered he alone is worthy of everything in your life. And so, oh, preacher, now you're just sounding right. You want us to go sell everything? <laughs> I'm wanting you to do what God tells you to do. Amen. I don't think he's going to have you sell your house tonight and put all your furniture out front. I don't. I really don't. But I know this, your mindset ought to be, if that's what he wants. I told you I was going to tell you how you'd know if you're all, you're all in or not. I wish y'all could see my view. You want to know how you know you're all in? Your face gives it away. I've preached this principles, these principles and messages in so many places, and I can look at it, and it's so funny. People who are all in, whew, yes. And they're smiling, yes. Then their spirit is agreeing with God's spirit, and others of you are going, this man's insane. <laughs> He's lost his mind. Who does he think? We, we're not going to do that. You're living on somebody else's commitments. You're living on them. They're not yours. I, he's worthy of my whole life. During the days when Thomas Jefferson was president, they were traveling across the country on horseback, looking at the countryside, surveying some areas, looking at territories and they came to a place where a river was completely out out of its banks blew the bridge out no way to cross and there were people waiting on the bank for the water to come down that they might could figure out a way to cross the river so thomas jefferson and his entourage show up and there's a man who desperately wanted to get from one side of that river to the other had business on the other side and he's walking up and down the entourage of Thomas Jefferson's horsemen, and he's wanting to cross, and he's just looking at them. And finally, he comes to the president and says, Sir, will you let me uh, ride behind you and go across the river? Because they were talking about just swimming the horses. He just reached down, and the president just pulled him back up on the saddle and went immediately into the river. And here, everybody else that was on horseback went into the river. Now, again, I grew up on a farm, and I've, listen, it's great fun to swim horses in the pond and little creeks and stuff. It's not so much fun when you're just in a turbulent river. And so it was risky. But here they went in. They got to the other side, 
and all of the president's men came around when this man got down and said, why did you pick him? Why did you ask the president of the United States if you could cross the river with him? The man was shocked. This is not the day of the Internet. They didn't even have good photographs. He didn't know that was the president. That's Mr. Jefferson? Well, sir, I'm so sorry. It's great to meet you. But why did you ask him and not one of us? He said... As I walked up and down, uh, the, you guys who were mounted up, he said, all of your faces said no. And his face said yes. And I chose him because I knew he could get me from this side to that side. <laughs> and when you start talking about the kingdom of God and the work of God and the treasure of God and the treasure of doing his will and the treasure of knowing him, your face tells you which side of the river you're on. <laughs> if you know he's brought you safely from one side to the next and he's worthy of everything in your life, your face tells you. And the rest of you need to go home and get, get the mirror down. <laughs> and go, I'm not all in. I'm just not all in. I don't know why, but I'm not all in. But I need to be all in because I'd like the joy, Amen. the joy that comes with this. All right, I'm going to quit. It's just time to quit. If you have a no face today, perhaps you need a reevaluation. Think about what he has given you, what you hold, what you possess. Did you do it or he do it? Is your life his or is it yours? You've missed the whole message of the Bible if you don't realize I'm bought with a price. He paid it all and all to him I owe. Lord, it's all yours. My life is yours. What would you have me to do? What would you have me to hold back? Just guide me. Just guide me in it. Heavenly Father, bless your people tonight. Lord, messages like this that stir us deep. Lord, no doubt many here tonight could go back to a point in their life where they made some decisions. Lord, it was a giving of our life. It was a surrendering of things. It was answering the same wording that you gave Peter. Do you love me more than these? Lord, there's always something in this world to compare. Do we love you more than this? Lord, I pray you have our whole heart tonight. Lord, I do pray for those that are in the struggle of these things. And Lord, the struggle is good. Lord, it's usually you wrenching things around in our life and reminding us that you own it all. Every man dies broke. Lord, but your reward is with you. Lord, may we amass treasure there. And Lord, I know there's proper stewardship and there's all kinds of things that the Word of God tells about all that. But, Lord, the beginning place is already all in. Lord, help us to be at the beginning place, to realize whose we are and who you are. Guide our hearts and our lives tonight. Our heads are still bowed. Our eyes are still closed. I'm going to begin with the Christians first tonight. And just a simple, I'm just, I'm just trying to think of just a simple sentence question to ask you. Has the Spirit of God unsettled some stuff in your heart and life tonight? that you need to go make a reevaluation about. If that's you, just slip your hand up and say, yep, he's, Spirit of God has spoke to my heart tonight and unsettled some things. In a moment, I'll close us in prayer and praying for you and God knows your hand and God knows your heart and that's all there is to do with it is just you coming to an agreement with that, walk through that struggle together. So many hands, my goodness, you can put yours down. If you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as Savior, in that simple little verse, here's the principles. He's walked across the field of this world and he found you. And he loves you. And he sold everything that he had to buy you. That's principle. He gave it all that he could make a way for you. He says, I will be your God. I want you. I want you. Will you have me? Will you love me? Will you treasure me the way I treasure you? 
if you don't know if you were to die tonight, heaven would be your home. I want to encourage you to pray right now and confess what you know to be true, that God loves you, that you're a sinner, but though you're a sinner, he still found you where he was. He treasured you, gave his life for you, and desires for you to have him. If you need help wording a prayer like that, would you, I'll just pray this prayer. You can word it right behind me. You don't have to pray it out loud. Just pray it out of your heart. If he's speaking to your heart, drawing you to himself, if he's speaking love to you right now, pray this way. Dear God, thank you for finding me. Thank you that I'm sitting in this spot at this time. I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sins. Thank you that you valued my life worthy to yours. Be my Savior. I ask it by faith. I ask it in Jesus' name.